And with that, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19, somebody's baby is going to leave today. They, then they arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. It came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to her son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. And it came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. The word of the Lord and the church declared, amen. amen. The title of this morning's message is, you can't pick your due date. You can't pick your due date. Father, in the midst of all the chaos of our culture, would you speak now? We are leaning in. We want to hear what you have to say. We're going to catch this word, and it's going to carry us to the next place in you. Anoint me, dear God. Help me to speak to your people in the midst of all of this. Be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last Sunday, our third child entered into the world. Yeah, that's good. Kimberlyn Joy Upshaw was born on August 23rd at 11.57 p.m., three days after her due date. My wife and I actually thought that she was coming early because Lindsay's stomach was so, so big. Isn't it amazing how a large belly on a woman makes everybody a prophet? You know, you'd be walking in the, the grocery store and the seasoned saint looks at her and says, oh, child, you're carrying low. And, and they, they're convinced. It's like, you're going to have a boy. <laughs> and then there are the people that always want to prophesy twins over your life. Even though the ultrasound only shows one child, they wink at you and say, well, you never know. <laughs> You might have a double anointing. And then there are the friends who want to predict the date. Well, the 20th came and went. Then Friday the 21st came, no baby. Saturday brought forth no fruit of the loins. But early Sunday morning, my wife started having contractions. I woke up around 7 o'clock and I was getting ready to go and come here actually, but my wife disclosed to me that she had been dealing with contractions since about 5 a.m. So I, I called Elder Mack and told him that he was it and that we were gonna go to New Haven where the hospital was and uh, we decreed and declared that we were gonna have a baby by the time the morning was out. So we packed everything up, hopped in the car, drove to New Haven. My wife's the type of person, she doesn't wanna spend more time in the hospital than she needs to. So we had a strategy, we were gonna go and we were gonna walk and we were going to walk that baby out. We were going to walk that baby out. Now, the contractions were light. I can't tell you what light contractions feel like because I'm not a woman and I've never given birth. All I know is that these light contractions uh, weren't as intense as the act of labor contractions, but they were contractions nonetheless. We were tracking the contractions, and they fluctuated from between six minutes to eight minutes or nine minutes. And so we're in New Haven, and, and we're walking. Uh, but no baby is coming. We're just getting tired. And then it's service time around 10 a.m., so we all pile in the truck, and, and we sit, and we're going to watch service. Um, Dad Green was with us at that point. And uh, it's funny because Elder Mack was preaching, and, and he said, you know, hopefully by the end of this message, <laughs> we'll hear some good news. And we were hoping to hear some good news, too, that this baby would go ahead and come on. But by, by the time the benediction came, there was no baby. So we decided we're going to go out and we're going to walk some more. We're going to walk some more. Lindsay getting tired. I'm getting tired. Dad's getting tired. And we still have no baby. We get to the middle of the afternoon and still no baby has arrived. In fact, it seems like the contractions are getting further apart. So we just call and we say, you know what? Maybe we just need to go to the hospital. We'll let the doctor check because she's obviously having contractions. Uh, let's just go get checked and see if the doctor will admit her. So we went. They put you in this little triage area before they send you to the birthing room. 
A resident came, checked her vitals. All the vitals were good. The baby was sounding good. Uh, the resident checked for what we call dilation to see how many centimeters the cervix has opened up. Now, brothers, there are certain things that they didn't teach you in high school science that happen in a woman when they're about to give birth. One of the things that you may have forgotten is that there's a cervix. In order for the baby to come, the cervix has to open up. The cervix is closed. Ain't nothing getting through. But to give you an example, if a cervix is one centimeter, it's about the size of a blueberry. That cervix has to open up to the size of a cantaloupe to allow the baby to pass through. So usually the doctor is looking for about five to six inches in order to say that it's time to admit uh, the woman to have the baby. The resident comes in, checks her and says, well, you're about four centimeters. You're having regular contractions. So we're gonna go ahead and admit you. So we're like, great, we're gonna have this baby today. We get into the birthing room. Everything now was like an hour and a half wait. It's just a lot of waiting, a lot of waiting to wait. Eventually the doctor comes and we discover that Lindsay actually hasn't broken her water yet. So the doctor has a strategy and says, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna manually break your water, and then that's going to induce the labor, and then hopefully we'll have a child. So she comes back like an hour or so later, and she gets ready to check in order to break the water, but she can't get through. And she takes a step back, she says, I have some bad news. Uh, the resident thought you were four centimeters, um, you're only like one and a half to two. So we're like scratching our head, like how are we going backwards? I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, thought we were, I thought we were getting closer. And now, now you're telling us that, that we're going backwards. And so we had two options. There were three options. The first option was to stay, but they would put us in one of the special units and the doctor had to check and see if there were any beds available. She came back, there were no beds available. So that option was out. The other option was for the doctor to induce labor with Pitocin. And once the labor was induced, Lindsay would go into labor. The problem is that if her cervix had not opened up yet, then they would have to perform a C-section, which was not an option for us because Lindsay wanted to have natural birth. The third option was to go home. Now, you got you to gotta think about this. My wife was ready to have this baby on the due date. We thought the baby was coming early. She and I went to New Haven with the intention of not leaving until we came back with a baby. We had told all of y'all that we were in labor. And so we're like, I mean, how embarrassing is that? You come home, everybody's going to be asking, where's, where, you know, where's the baby at? And we're like, the baby hasn't come yet. <laughs> so we, we talked about it. We had a little conference, but, but we decided that it was more important for the baby to come naturally. And we were going to let um, God do his work through, through nature. So we packed everything up. By this point, it's late. It's getting close to 10 o'clock. We hop in the truck. We drive back to Bridgeport. You know, that's about 25, 30 minutes from New Haven. Walk in the door, sit down in the kitchen, grab a snack. We're trying to decide, I mean, what do we do? We still have this adrenaline because we wanted to have a baby today. Baby hasn't come. Do we go to bed? Do we lay down? What do we do? So we're just talking, having a conversation, but, but Lindsay's contractions are getting stronger. And now we're looking at the watch and we're timing them like, man, that one was five minutes. That one was four minutes. And we kind of look at each other and like, I, I don't think we're staying home tonight. And around that time in the kitchen, Lindsay's water broke. Now, when I tell you that her water broke, I'm talking about like TLC, don't go chasing waterfalls, water type of breaking. I'm talking Bishop Morton opened the floodgates of heaven, <laughs> let it rain. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, out of all of the kids that my wife has had, none of them had their water break like that. I mean, it's exactly like what you see on television, just <laughs> I look at it, I said, well, I guess we're going back to the hospital. So we walked in the door around 10 o'clock by 10.15, her water had broken. By 10.30, 10.35, we were in the car speeding, trying to get to New Haven, because there is no way we're about to have this baby in the front seat of my SUV. So we're driving. I'm not gonna tell you how fast I was driving, but we were driving. 
the thing is, the doctor had told us that it could, the baby could come tonight or the baby could come two or three days later. But it was all based on the opening of her cervix. So, so, so we, we got back. And let's just say we got into the birthing room by 11.30. Lindsay was pushing at like 11.51. The baby was here by 11.57. Late in the midnight hour, <laughs> the baby came before the day was done. Uh, what's, the, what's the moral of this story? There, there are a few things that the Lord was just dealing me with, dealing with me about. Um, you know, friends can, can try to predict what will happen. Prophets will try to speak what will happen. Doctors will try to, through logic, ascertain what should happen. But ultimately, God has the final say. Ultimately, you can't pick your due date. Only God can determine it. And in our culture, there are so many opinions and voices swirling around our heads. With all the recent events that have been happening in our world and in our country, the political theater that's happening with both of these conventions, another shooting, another round of protest, another lengthy conversation about who's right, who's wrong, which side are you on? I was asking the Lord, Lord, why is this such a difficult time? Here's what the Lord showed me, because everybody's talking, everybody's giving an opinion, everybody's giving commentary. It's amazing how many people are giving opinions, yet they have no qualification to give the opinions that they're spouting out. We live in a culture that feels like we have to comment on everything. Case in point, even with sports, I love sports, I love the NBA, but there are entire commentators whose salaries are based on just making stuff up to talk about. And if there's nothing real to talk about, they make something up to talk about. They make their predictions. I think this, Charles Barkley predicted that the Lakers were going to get swept by the Blazers. And obviously he's not a prophet because the Lakers won the series. It's just crazy. But, but listen to me, in our culture, we have a tendency to talk. We have a tendency to predict. We have a tendency to attempt to try to say, this is the way it is, this is the way it's going to be, but I need you to understand how God is operating in this season. God does what he wants to do, when he wants to do, in his sovereignty, he knows. In his sovereignty, he speaks. And concerning some things, only God knows your due date, which brings us to our focal passage for today. We meet a woman named Hannah, who finally got her due date, but not without much difficulty. At the beginning of the chapter in 1 Samuel, we learned that Hannah is barren and without children. You see, in ancient times, it was deemed a curse if a woman could not have a child for her husband. If a woman could not produce for her husband, she was assumed to be out of right standing with God, and she is assumed to have sinned or done something that warranted her to have such a despised position. In that culture, if you were a wife and you could not produce life, people looked at you, they shunned you, they ridiculed you. In this particular interesting setup, how many of you ever read the Bible, you see interesting things? Just because it's interesting doesn't mean that it's the way that you should live life now. Back then, Elk and I had two, two wives. Um, and, and this was a really strange situation because one wife had lots of kids, the other one could not produce. So, so the other wife started bothering and ridiculing Hannah because of the fact that she could not bear children. So much so that this became a continual problem of shame for Hannah. She just felt so lost because she could not produce a child. But here's what I want you to see about Hannah. Hannah is an example of someone who loves and trusts God even in the midst of their disappointment. Hannah is powerful. She's a powerful example of what it means to trust God even in the midst of you not getting what you desire. Even though she was infertile, she still worshiped the God who closed her womb. 
Now, it's important that when you read the scripture, you see that it was God who closed her womb. That's literally what the scripture said. God closed her womb. God was the reason why she was not producing life. But the scripture indicates that she was willing to worship him in spite of the fact that he had closed her womb. She was faithful even though she was fruitless. She was devoted even though she was disappointed. I want to ask you the question today. Can you remain devoted even in your disappointment? Can, can you remain faithful evil in, even in your fruitlessness? Can you continue to worship even when God closes your womb? Here's what I notice. This is what happens in today's culture. Um, if God doesn't do something for us, it's easy for us in our humanity to begin to protest God by withholding our worship, withholding our prayer, and withholding our service to him. We have promises that we believe that God has spoken to us. We have things that we feel like we should be doing, places that we feel like we should be going, things that we should be accomplishing. And what happens is when those things don't happen in a time frame that we like, we tend to protest. We'll come into the house of the Lord, but we ain't lifting our hands. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll claim to be Christians, yet, yet our prayers have no more sincerity. Uh, we, will, we will withhold our service because we feel like God hasn't met our needs. God hasn't answered our, our, our prayers. And, and I want you to glean strength today from Hannah because Hannah was the type of person who worshiped God in spite of she stayed faithful even though what she wanted the most had not happened. Can I help you out in today's culture? We live in this microwave society where we feel like if we don't get what we want, when we want it, then it gives us a license to just disconnect and do what we want to do. But when we see Hannah, we see a continual faithfulness. She stayed the course even though she did not have what she desired. The culture says, seek pleasure above all. If it feels good to you, go forward, go towards it. If it doesn't feel good, then maybe it's not for you. And people have left their position with God because they feel like they haven't achieved that which they wanted in the time frame that they desired. But Hannah wasn't like that. Hannah didn't give up on God because she did not have life in her womb. We see her as a devoted person. To the Lord. She is one of the most devoted women in Old Testament scripture. In fact, when we see her praying in 1 Samuel, we actually see one of the longest prayers recorded in the Old Testament by anyone, much less a woman. But here's what I want you to see about Hannah. In the midst of her despair, in the midst of her disappointment, she had to go to the house of God. She had to go to the temple. In the midst of of her haters, in the midst of someone ridiculing her because of her life position, in the midst of her husband not understanding this pain that she had on the inside because she could not bear a child. In the midst of that, her mindset was that she needed to get to the temple. I just believe that there's a reason why God has us opening up right now in this moment. There's something happening in the midst of our culture Things are getting crazier and crazier. Things are getting even more chaotic. This presidential election is splitting the body of Christ. People aren't talking to one another because of their political preferences. The devil is a liar. Don't let, forgive my French, some stupid commentary from someone that you don't even know sitting on the screen choosing topics in order to get ratings cause you to break relationships with people who are in the body of Christ who may not see things exactly like you see them, but we see the cross in the middle of us. And so we are joined together by the blood of the lamb. These are divisive times where people are split because I'm a part of this gang or excuse me, political party or, or, or I, I wreck red. I thought they did that in the streets. What you repping? I'm repping my red. I'm repping my blue. The real gangsters are in the... And this has this culture where people are losing their sanity and their peace of mind. And then, and then, and then Black Panther, gone. 
the people that you would expect to live long, healthy lives are checking out of here. And then there are things going on in our lives personally. I'm getting call after call of people getting uh, um, bad medical news and they're in the hospital and they're wrestling with forms of cancer and, and people are losing loved ones and brothers are, are getting shot and, 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 and mothers are just, just falling dead. And in the midst of all of this, the question is, where do we go? And I'm here to remind you that there's power in going to the temple. There's something significant about getting to the house of God. And there's certain things that the temple can provide that Instagram won't. Certain things that the presence of God, the sanctuary, the altar will provide you that you can't find at your kitchen table. God is opening up a new dispensation where we have to get back to the physical place of God because there's an anointing in this place and the an anointing that's in this place can help us with all of the anarchy that's going on out there. Hannah got in her mind that in the midst of my trouble, in the midst of my distress, I need to get to the temple. I need to get to the altar. I need to hear from the Lord. I need to talk to God. Turn off the phone. Turn off the television. Stop watching CNN and MSNBC. Stop watching Fox News and get reacquainted with the channel of prayer and fasting and seeking the face of the Lord. Some answers are only going to come when you get back into the right position. <laughs> Hannah said, I got to get to the temple. I, I got to get to the temple. See, see, Hannah understood the sovereignty of God. If God had indeed closed her womb, that he was the only one who could open it up. It's so funny because when, when you're trying to give birth to a baby, people have all these different tips as to how you can speed up the process. You can eat this, you can do this, or you can do that. The bottom line is the baby is coming when God says that he's coming. The baby is coming when God says that she's coming. Hannah understood that if God closed her womb, that he was the only one who can open her womb up if it was his will and his choice. So she went to the temple. Yes, God is everywhere. Yes, God speaks through the broadcast. Yes, God can perform sanctuaries and your home and establish altars and other places, but there's something about the collective consecrated house of God as sometimes you gotta get to the physical altar. And, and, and I just wanna remind all of us who serve, it's easy for us to just kinda walk in the doors and get to our service and we say our little prayer as we're walking through the doors, but the culture of this church was built at the altar. There's something about stopping what you're doing, getting to the altar first, flip it and flourish. Instead of doing everything else first, go to him first so that he can give you revelation and understanding regarding how to do your work for the day. There's something powerful about the altar and the physical house of God. And I just believe that God is stirring something up in this region, stirring something up in this place. He's giving us the privilege of coming back together because there's power that he wants to distribute it to the people of God. Direct power. Hannah stumbled into the sanctuary. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. She greatly distressed, look at this, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord, and wept bitterly. There's a tendency in our life that when we get greatly distressed, we get ghost. You know how it is when somebody ghosts you, uh, they don't return your text messages. When, when they ghost you, you, you don't see them anymore. When they ghost you, they were, they, at one point, they were connected, but then at a certain point, just, because they're dealing with the difficulties of life and isolation, but, but Hannah gives us a model. We come to the sanctuary in our distress. We come to the Lord with our difficulty. She prayed to the Lord as she wept bitterly. If you're gonna weep bitterly, you might as well weep bitterly in the house of the Lord. If you're going to cry, if you're going to have some choice words for the Lord, I'd rather you express your choice words for the Lord in his sanctuary, in, in the power of his presence, of his temple, than to do so by yourself in isolation. She gives us a model that we come and we worship in spite of how we feel. In fact, sometimes we bring our frustrations and we serve a God who speaks to us. Now, I want you to see the type of prayer that she offers up. She doesn't offer up a pity prayer. She offers up a prayer that is 
that is anchored with covenant language. Verse 11, she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will look indeed on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but give your maidservant a son, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. She's making a commitment. And a razor shall never come on his hand. So what she's literally saying is, Lord, if you give me a child, if you give me this baby, then I will give him back to you. First, sequential and central, I will give him back to you. If you give me this child, I will offer him back to you. In fact, I will make him take the Nazareth vow. He will not cut his hair and he will be dedicated totally and completely to you. I don't know what you're praying for in this hour. I don't know what you're believing God for in this hour. I don't know what you are calling on the name of the Lord for in this hour, but whatever it is, when you get it, you need to dedicate it back to God. <laughs> that was not the hour for you to pray uh, these prayers asking God for something and then once he blesses you with what you ask him for then you turn your back on him because you got what you wanted when you seek his face and not simply his hand then you invite the favor of God over your life and you allow him to reign over that which he blessed you with let me give it to you this way people will pray for a job God I'm so broke I need money. I need sustainability. Lord, if you bless me with this job, I'll continue to worship you. I'll continue to serve you. Then they get the job and then they begin to serve the job rather than serving the God who gave them the job. And all of a sudden, they can't tithe because now they have money and they're going to spend their money on the things that they want. And they've developed this mindset that now I'm self-sufficient. Now I don't need God because I got what I think I needed. But they don't realize that what they really needed was a relationship with the Father, the same God who gave you this job is the same God who can give you another job and the same God who blessed you with this paycheck is the same God who can increase your bonus and give you more money so why not give to him what is first on the front end trusting that he will give you more and the same God that kept you while you were broke the same God that you were crying out to when you didn't have any money and you were in despair the same God whom you serve because you ain't had nothing else to do is the same God who was worthy of your attention and your focus now that you've started from the bottom and you're here don't you forget who allowed you to raise up don't you forget the one who exalted you because if you want to be exalted more you got to continue to humble yourself God is saying in this hour when I bless you with something that you've prayed for don't get it twisted it still belongs to me Hannah demonstrates the power of praying for something and then once that something comes dedicating it back to God she made a commitment that 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 my son will be dedicated totally and completely to God. Now, verse 12, it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. Now, Eli was the current priest. Eli was old in his age. He was actually coming to the end of his tenure, but he was the priest of the temple. He saw this woman come into the sanctuary, and she was in so much distress that she looked like she was drunk. Have you ever found yourself in a place in life where things are going so bad, so difficult, um, that, that you no longer have a dignified praise. <laughs> you no longer have a dignified prayer. See, the prayer flows differently when you're desperate. <laughs> you don't have time for all of your these and your thous. You're not speaking in King James Version. You, you forget all of your protocol. You're crying out to the Lord. You're in distress because you need God to move on your behalf. You need him to see about your family. You need him to see about the things that concern you. Hannah, at that moment, was not pretty in her expression, so much so that the man of God saw her from afar and thought that she had been sipping on a little something, something. So the man of God, trying to make sure that there's still order in the house of God, approached her. Now, Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought that she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, how long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. Now, Hannah has a choice at this moment. You know, she can either <laughs> submit to the man of God or her neck can start moving and her fingers can start working. And um, she could just give him a piece of her mind. But, but this is how Hannah replied, No, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before 
the Lord. Hannah could have caught a huge attitude with the man of God. Here's what I want you to see, that sometimes the priest and the pastor don't always get it right on the first try. Pastors are human. Men and women of God are human. Sometimes we have to approach things from what we initially see. And, and, and with the limited information that we have, we try our best to call it, but we don't always get it right. This is a season, and I mentioned this on Tuesday, where every believer needs a home, needs a church, needs a, a pastor. And the role of the pastor is to bring the sheep to the right pastors and the still waters. And in order for that to happen, there has to be exchange and interaction. And sometimes in that exchange and interaction, uh, we get to places that are tense and, and we're trying to understand one another. And those misunderstandings are gonna happen. We live in a culture now that the moment you have a misunderstanding, people write you off totally and completely. But no relationship is developed without some form of conflict or misunderstanding. In fact, if you handle the conflict well, then perhaps you'll see a growth in the relationship. Don't waste a good conflict. A good conflict is actually designed to strengthen the relationship because when it's all said and done, after we've reconciled, we know more about each other. There's a clarity of each other's heart and we realize that we're both having the same goals. We just have a different perspective about it. And if you embrace conflict the right way, you can actually come out with stronger relationships. So in that moment, Hannah had a choice. She submitted to leadership. And watch this, even though Eli got it wrong at first, the blessing still came through him. <laughs> I told you that there's something powerful about the temple in these times. There's also something powerful about spiritual leadership. There are some blessings that can only come from being covered properly. Certain blessings that can only come by coming into the house of the Lord. And in these crazy times, sometimes you need a pastor. You need a spiritual leader who can speak certain things into your life. Hannah has spent all that time praying, hoping that she could have a child, crying out to the Lord. But it was only when Eli spoke. <laughs> that the blessing was transferred into her life. Verse 17 says that Eli answered and said, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She came in distress, but by the time she was done, she had a smile on her face. Verse 18 says, she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. Can you see the power and the anointing that flows from the head down into the people of God? There's something that God wants to transfer in this hour. Can I speak prophetically for just a moment? The enemy wants to divide and conquer. The enemy wants to get us to a place of isolation. Sometimes he entices us with isolation because we feel like I can do bad all by myself. We feel like I don't need them and I don't need they. I don't need somebody telling me what to do or how to live my life. That's just the trick of the enemy. The enemy will lull you into a place of complacency. He will sell you with the sweet seduction of temptation and get you to a place where you're convinced that it's better on the other side and once you get content in your complacent situation apart from God that's when he snaps that's where he changes that's where his disposition shifts and now he's got you in a place where he can have you all to himself there's a spirit in the earth that's trying to break up the body of Christ trying to break up local congregations trying to split relationships with accountability partners and because of COVID COVID-19 and because of civil unrest and because of economic problems and troubles, we begin to convince ourselves that all of that ain't necessary and we just want to nurse our wombs. I'm here to remind you that there is power in community. If you've got some good friends who love the Lord, who are saved, sanctified with the Holy Spirit, trying to live their life according to the word of God, you better hold on to them. Don't push them away. You need them in your life. If you've got a pastor, if you've got elders, if you've got ministers, they may not be perfect, they may not be well known, but if they're people of integrity, if they're preaching the word of God, if they're living according to the scriptures, if they're willing to try their best to tell you how to live your life the right way, you better hold on to them because things are going to get rocky over these next few years and you need a place of refuge. You need a place that you can run through. You need a place where you can get sound counsel. You need a place where you need wisdom. You need a place where you can come and find peace in the midst of the storm you might need a literal place to run to 
<laughs> you might need a little building to come to. A fortress to stand under in the midst of all of this chaos and craziness. You need the temple. And you need the priest. <laughs> Don't let the enemy pull you away from the orthodoxy of the faith. Don't let these little YouTube videos, because you Googled something, heard something, somebody shared something to you. In the spirit of this age, there is deception. Before we see the Antichrist, there will be the spirit of the Antichrist. And the scripture indicates that even the elect can be deceived. There are three forms of spiritual warfare. We talk about oppression. We talk about possession. But too often or not, we don't talk about deception. The first act of spiritual warfare was deception. Everything was perfect in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and their relationship with God. God set them up nice, established and gave them purpose, told them to be fruitful and multiply. But here comes the serpent in chapter 3. And what was his tool? He didn't put a demon in Adam and Eve. He lured them with deception. He, he got into Eve's head. He used demonic logic. He appealed to the pleasure of her flesh and her desire to be greater than God. Be careful in this hour. Be careful. I, I'm going to step on some toes, but before you wholeheartedly jump into a movement, you got to understand those who founded the movement. I, I might get in trouble for this, but, but, but when you see a movement, you've got to research what that movement stands for before you fully, completely immerse yourself in it. Be, be, before you ascribe to a practice, you've got to understand the practice in which you are ascribing to and the roots of it. Because deception is running rampant in this hour. Deceptions on the blue side and the red side. But you have to be discerning, which is why we got to shift. I don't know why the Lord has me here, but I told you a few weeks ago we shifted into a place of warfare. You can't keep on sitting back and just allowing the fight to go on around you without putting on your camouflage and hearing from the general in heaven and getting an understanding of how you need to ante up, how you need to strap up. You need your Bible in one hand, newspaper in the other. You need your tool in one hand, and you need your weapon in the other hand. Worship, work, and warfare. We've shifted into a place of warfare, but will you sleep throughout all of it? Hannah had to get to the house of the Lord. She had to receive a word from the priest. And the blessing came to her because she eventually gave birth to Samuel. If you continue reading the scripture, she, she fulfilled her vow. Don't miss that. She fulfilled her vow. She fulfilled her vow. We have to be vow keepers in this hour. One of the indications of the last days is that people will say stuff and they will not keep their word. They will break covenant. This is an hour to keep covenant. Watch this. If you said you're going to do it, then you need to do it. From the smallest things to the largest things. What we do sometimes is in our despair, we make a commitment that we cannot keep because we're trying to get out of hot water. We're trying to get out of a difficult situation. We're trying to, to get some relief. And God is saying in this hour, if you make a commitment to me, I need you to keep it. Amen. Hannah fulfilled her commitment. She brought Samuel to Eli once he was of age and dedicated him to the temple like she said he would. But here's what I want to leave you today. Hannah gave birth to her son in the midst of difficult times. You remember I told you earlier that you can't pick your due date? Out of all of the decades and years to have a baby, <laughs> we just had to have ours in the infamous 2020. I, I want you to think about this. If, if, if you were having a baby, <laughs> Would you want to have your baby in the midst of a global pandemic that swept the world and caused economies of nations to break? 
If you were having a child, would you say, Lord, please send me a child in the midst of civil unrest and a political election year that is so polemic that people are walking away from lifelong friendships? You can't pick your due date. But because God is sovereign, you have to trust his ways. You know what makes me weep? Listen to me. I'm not bothered. You guys got to hear my heart on this. I'm not bothered about leaving this earth and transitioning to death. That doesn't bother me because I know where my eternal home is. Let me, let me say that again. I'm not bothered by the premise of leaving this earth because I believe what I preach. When actors and celebrities pass away at a young age, I think what's jarring for most people is that it reminds them of their mortality because if Black Panther can die, then so can I. If Black Mamba can die, then so can I. But when you're a believer, you have to be anchored in the truth of the word. What causes me to weep is not me leaving this earth. Listen to me. It's what my children will have to endure after I'm gone. You know you've shifted into a place of spiritual maturity where you're not just worried about you. You're worried about the generation that's coming after you. Because if we're dealing with this now, can you imagine what our children are going to deal with 20 to 30 years from now? That's what concerns me. Will they be able to stand in the midst of these evil times? As things get worse, as the moral compass of our nation becomes more and more fuzzy, as more and more people turn their back on God, will they be able to grasp on to something that will anchor them? You can't pick your due date. Hannah prayed for Samuel. Samuel arrived in very difficult times. I'm going to share three things that were happening in the times of Samuel. And then we're going to pray in close for today. First thing, Samuel was born in the midst of corruption amongst the priesthood. Eli was getting old and Eli's sons were taking over the priesthood but they were corrupt. They were stealing from the sacrifices. They were, they were improper with women. It had become a stain on the priesthood. And here God is raising up young Samuel to reverse the damage of a broken priesthood. Something is stirring in the body of Christ. I'll make the connection in just a moment. So we were dealing with the problematic priesthood. Second thing Samuel had to endure in his lifetime. There come a point where the people that he had to lead because in that time the priest, the prophet, the judge spoke for God and led the nation based on the word of the Lord. Samuel had proven to be a great judge and a great prophet. But you ever heard of generational cycles? Ironically enough, even though Samuel was righteous and pure, the scripture indicates in 1 Samuel chapter 8 that his sons did not roll how he rolled. Because the leadership of God's house wasn't right, the people were led astray. Smite the shepherd, scatter the sheep. Where there's no vision, the people perish. They cast off restraint. Where there's no oracle, no word from the Lord, vision, where God is not speaking concerning direction, people do what they want to do. The people came to Samuel and said, we want a king. Like all these other nations, we want a king. Samuel went back to God and said, God, 
I mean, they're asking for a king, and, and I feel really bad about it. And God is like, look, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as their king. But here's what I want you to do. Go ahead and give them what they asked for. But when you give them a king, remind them that this king is going to send their children off to war. This king is going to tax their produce. This king is going to put heavy burdens on them. Give them what they asked for. Samuel, in his lifetime, had to deal with people literally rejecting God. And then the third thing that Samuel had to deal with was wickedness in the highest forms of government. That king that the people asked for, Saul, flipped the script and was rebellious against God. And Samuel had to oversee the transition of leadership in an unstable government with someone in charge who did not heed the voice and the command of the Lord. Hannah couldn't pick her due date God had so determined that she would have the baby in that season and that time, she offered that baby to the Lord. And Samuel became strategic in the midst of all the chaos of that culture to represent God's heart. I wouldn't have picked 2020 for Kimberly and Joy to come into this world, but I just got to believe that God has a purpose for her and the rest of my children in the midst of this wicked age. priesthood is broken in many ways pastors have been lifted up onto pedestals that they cannot handle scandal abuse of the flock is running rampant in certain circles as pastors sometimes it's easy to play to the desires of the people and not tell them the truth in order to keep your numbers and to keep giving up and to keep everything going and when we are more concerned about how comfortable people are rather than telling them the truth we can see our effectiveness and power from the pulpit diminish the priesthood had to be reformed in samuel's time and i'm telling you the pastorate has to be reformed in these times we need a different measure of success, not mega church, but mega impact, not your ability to cause people to swoon and to rock and to sway when you preach, but there has to be a character on your life that's undeniable and they're more impressed by the way you live and raise your kids than they are by your ability to use big words that they can't understand anyway. There must be an authenticity and spiritual leadership in this hour. The priesthood has to be reformed. Just as they rejected God as king in Samuel's day, people have rejected God as king in today's culture. Postmodernism, these thoughts and these ideas about moral relativism, I can live the way I want to live as long as I'm living the way that I want to live, it's all good. A pluralistic society where everybody has their ideas the only problem is there's a culture right now that is trying to squeeze traditional Christianity out people have created their own kings made themselves king people have mixed politics and religion listen to Bishop Von McLaughlin the other night in the midnight cry people have made this hybrid syncretistic Syncretism is where you take something that's orthodox and then you mix it with other things. And nationalism has become a religion in and of itself. Don't you ever get it twisted and confused. There's a difference between God and a political party. And no one political party has a monopoly on God. And it's dangerous to get to a place where one or two or two are one and the same. And God is saying in this hour, I know you got to vote. I know you got to select leadership, but don't you ever forget who is king. All types of spiritualities running around. You got to be very careful and very discerning that you don't get caught up in something that you didn't realize you were getting caught up into. And you're chanting and repeating stuff invoking things that you had no clue that you were bringing to bear. Last but not least, 
You dealt with the priesthood that had to be reformed. People have rejected God and those who had been selected to govern had turned their backs from God as well. We're dealing with all of that today. You can't pick your due date. For all of you who are having children in 2020, this is hard, but don't you ever forget the sovereignty of God. He raises up remnants. He raises up deliverers. I believe that there's an anointing on the children that are being born in 2020. There's a remnant rising up. I prophesied something at the beginning of this pandemic about this generation, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds who got the benefit of spending time with their parents and social distancing. I hope you didn't squander that time because there was something you were supposed to be depositing in them, something that need to mark them. Their lives will never be the same because of what they witnessed. Kids coming to Christ in the midst of social distancing while watching service with their parents and their family together. There's something that God is setting up. We may not be able to see it all now, but it's happening and it's moving. And for those of you who feel like you have a baby that's delayed, I'm speaking figuratively now. Something that you believe that God has in store for you that hasn't happened yet, that hasn't occurred yet, and you're waiting for it to happen. I want to remind you that this is the hour that when God blesses you with what he has promised, that you give it back to him. And what you give back to him is supposed to deal with the things that are coming down the pipe.